Welcome to the All Out Coach Show. My name is Tim Mikelashvili. I'm your host. Now in its third season, it's been a long time since I've been thinking that there is one type of guest that was missing on this podcast, and that was an Olympian. An Olympian, an athlete, because of all of the different concepts in which we merge sportsmanship with scientific thinking uh, throughout all of my conversations with many other executives and in that spirit of inspiring people to stretch themselves and lift others. So today I am absolutely honored and uh, grateful that an Olympian, two-time Olympian, executive coach, keynote speaker for organizations such as Microsoft as well, who continues to pass the baton and pay forward and inspire other young athletes in swimming, in other sports, is joining me today. His name is Chris Cook. Uh, he's from Great Britain, and he's going to talk to us about uh, keeping things simple and uh, steady in that rise to championship, becoming a champion in life. Chris, what an honor to have you here on my show. Oh, what a lovely introduction. You are some wonderful fella. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I'm glad we connected and believe it or not, it was via LinkedIn through yeah. a digital channel, right? And how <laughs> unexpected was it that it also happened right before I was organizing this new, unique event in my industry, Medical mm. Affairs Innovation Olympics. So uh, I would like to ask you to tell us uh, about how you became an athlete and a swimmer first before you became an Olympian. Yeah, that's a good idea. Good place to start. So kind of going right back to the start, um, obviously I can call myself a two-time Olympian now and say I you know, I reached an Olympic final and got pretty close to that, that, that podium. But actually when I track it back, it started just watching it on TV. I remember watching the 1988 Olympic Games, age nine. It was in Seoul. Yep. And I watched a, a swimmer from Great Britain called Adrian Morehouse. Um, he was a breaststroke swimmer. And he won by a whisker. Um, but it was it was just the way it was. You know, there's certain medals that are won at the Olympics that just seem to capture the minds and hearts of the people, aren't there? there there's some medals that there's no disrespect. Some people win and they, they are champions. They win a wonderful medal. But then there are others that just seem to take us on a journey. And his, for me, did just that. Um, and I remember watching it thinking, that's what I want to be. I want to be an Olympic swimmer. And my granddad said, you know, dream big, start small, anything's possible. And that became my mantra at the age of nine. That's quite a powerful short sentence to rattle around your head. Um, joined a swimming club within a, a week or two and decided at that point, I remember walking in the doors thinking, oh, I'm not, I'm not coming back here. This is too scary. <laughs> you know, I'm not doing this. And that became a bit of a theme of my life, if I'm honest with you. Whenever there's a change, whenever there's something that's kind of a big turning point, I naturally back away. I get a bit fearful. And that's when I know something good's happening. <laughs> that's when I know instinctively something great from a personal perspective is going on. Joined a swimming club, met some fantastic people and started the, the process of training and training to win and standing on podiums. And there's a lot of miles in that story, though, and, and I share some of that as I go. Yeah. Well, you've become a, a coach yourself. Mm. So who have been some of the coaches uh, after you made that a goal of yours that played an important role in, in yeah. the rise to becoming a world championship athlete, a medalist, yeah. and a yeah. too? Yeah, so um, one of my very first coaches was a guy called Ken Nesworthy, still a really good friend now. Um, and he, he was pretty tough. You know, he was pretty tough. He didn't have a swimming background before he stepped onto the pool side. He was a parent watching it, um, was almost dragged into it one day and then thought, this is great. And, and he became one of the best coaches that I've ever crossed paths with just because of his mentality. You know, he was pretty, he was pretty tough. He didn't let you off. If you said you were going to do something, he expected you to do it. <laughs> and I learned from such a young age that this was about accountability. What he put in place was about, listen, you said this and this didn't turn up. I'm not annoyed. I just want a conversation with you. From the age of 9, 10, 11, 12, when you've got that in your life, running alongside, you start to get used to, well, if I'm going to say I'm going to do something, I've got to get moving on it. 
at the age of 19, I decided to move on to pastures new. I needed a, a different challenge. I moved on to work with a guy called Ian Oliver. And um, he was at the City of Newcastle Swimming Club and he was already coaching Olympic athletes. I remember walking onto the poolside for my very first session, watching people getting the pool ready, taking the pool cover off, putting the lane ropes in. And when you walked in the building, there was lots of flags uh, from different countries around the world. And that was the City of Newcastle Swimming Club's Hall of Fame. If you represented Great Britain in a country, let's just say Italy or France, they'd take down the French and Italian flag and they'd stitch your name into it. How cool. Yeah. And you would walk around this building around other Olympians and world-class athletes. So I, you had a blueprint. And the one thing that I started to learn was these people were sharing. They were they, they made themselves vul- what I thought was vulnerable. Why would they share it? Why would they, they, they get all of this IP, all of this knowledge, and then almost give it away? But actually in the giving away process, they became stronger. And that's when I started to learn. I guess I took a lot in for the first two years. And then after that, I started to share a lot. I started to get that confidence to share mm. a lot more. But what a what a whirlwind that was. Mm. What was your first breakthrough? You know, there's many very talented athletes out there, mm. young, at a young age. But yeah. there takes something else, a different caliber of performance, right, to make yeah. it to that international competitive level <clears throat> where you're representing your country. Can you uh, share that moment or that tournament? Yeah, there was two. There was... There was a training session when I was 30. Mm -hmm. I turned up to a Sunday morning session with Ken Nesworthy, the coach at the time. And there was only me turned up to the session. It was a summer summer training program that we had. And it was a bit of a skeleton training program. So most people had gone on holiday. There's no competitions happening. It was kind of pre-season. I turned up. And when when I was on poolside chatting with him, he said, hey, listen, there's no rush to get in. He said, "What, what do you want to achieve? out your career and I'd said well I want to win Olympic gold he said what do you think it'll take to get there he said because what I can see is it's going to take swimming under the minute because the minute barrier hadn't been broken yet on in a in an Olympic event in the men's 100 meters breaststroke and he said um do you want to have a go at it today <laughs> like what he said let's have a go at it today let's see if we can break the world record I was like we, we can't do that he said well we're going to do it in tiny chunks so we did the first length. It was it was four lengths. That's all we had to do. Four lengths under a minute. Yeah. Now I was nowhere near that at the time all together, but we did one length at a time and a rest in between. And I broke the minute. Added up all the times I broke the minute. And, and I got out of the pool and I stood with him. We were looking at the whiteboard and he'd written it in marker and pen and he'd said, okay, you're under the minute. We've done it. Now all we need to do is string it together and piece it together. He'd broken this massive goal down I was 13 and I'd broken a world record but hadn't really broken it and it started the process in my mind of thinking actually if I just take this one bite at a time this starts to become doable obviously it took me another 13 14 years to realize that which is a long long project (laughs) very long project but there was another turning point um and this was more competitive at the age of 21 I was struggling to break the British ranks I was struggling to break through the British ranks. I was getting into the top five, top four, but I wasn't getting onto the international teams, the big international teams. And my coach sat me down and he said, you know, the times that you're doing, if you eventually get onto the team, you're going to be in a really good standing when you get there. But I, I didn't think about that at the time. So every competition I went to locally in the, in the, in the UK was a high-level competition because – all of the people ahead of me were in the top 15 in the world. So all the other four breaststroke swimmers. There was one day I'd gone from fifth to second. I'd made a team. I'd made a European team. And when I got to the European Championships in Ireland, I got through the heats into the semifinal and into the final. And it was the first time I realized that actually often when we think we've got it tough, it's the tough bits that bring out the true athlete inside you know i had this dog fight for years with these guys who were in the uk and i couldn't get on these international teams once i broke through i wasn't just going and making the heats i was going through and now starting to get close to the podiums you know your competition can be your biggest asset 
if you use your competition, it can be your biggest asset, but you've got to let it in. You've got to let it in. And that was a that was a big turning point, a massive lesson wow. at the age of 21. Huge. Now, you mentioned, uh, Chris, that you let it's, it's important to let that in. Do mm. you remember that you at that moment you were appreciating competition or how fierce did competition seem to you at the time? Yeah, I don't think I was at the time, actually. I think that was the realization. That was the moment that I realized I was missing something here. I was missing a trick. You know, I would deliberately, I would go on training camps, but I wouldn't leave myself open. I'd be very guarded. You know, I was there with the rest of my competition. And if I gave anything away, they would use it against me. And yeah, there's an element of that. Everybody's looking for that competitive edge. But actually, once those walls start breaking down, they they start to expose your weaknesses, which is great. Most people are going, what? You, you, you celebrate that? Yeah, because we're looking for those 1%. We're looking for those, if you can get 10%, get it. You know, when you get to that level, 10% is everything. You're generally looking for much smaller percentage gains than that. And for me, it felt as though actually at the age of 21, that was the final frontier for me to really challenge myself on. Went on a training camp to Australia um, that very next year with all my competitors, pretty much. And that was the moment that I started to break down the walls and realize that collaboration was the way forward. Sharing was the way forward. We were competing against each other. And I remember being in one training session in Australia and the coach had just said to us, right, we're going to do this this part of this set. I'd like you all to be within 3% of your personal best for that's almost unheard of. That, that is such a challenge. Mm -hmm. And as we stood up and raced each other in this training session, I thought, we've got a world-class training session here. This is, you know, I don't have to manufacture it. It's actually here. I'm racing right. world number four right next to us, world number eight on the other side, world number 11 just on the inside of him, and I'm only breaking the top 20. And that was the moment that I thought, do you know what? I'm mixing it with the best here, and I'm, I'm holding my own, and... I've got something to give. And yeah, th th I think those milestones are really important as you go through your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're an optimist, it seems like. Yeah. Like as a president. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and was now that same coach that uh, kind of broke down that 100 meters into four lengths, <laughs> was he instrumental in your reaching the world championship stage? Yeah, or definitely. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, without a shadow of doubt. I remember um, he we had a very set swimming program when he first took over. It was it was swim, 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 swim. And that was the culture. Mm -hmm. And he came from a, a very different background. He came from athletics and football. Mm. And and he just said, uh, hey, let's try something different. Let's do let's ditch this swim session. Let's just go do aerobics or let's go and do yoga. And nobody's heard of this stuff. Like we were like, this guy's lost his mind. <laughs> But actually what he was doing is he was he was he was he was using the transferable skills model. When you really look at it as a playing coaching tool, he was going, these guys over here use these muscles and we use something similar. I wonder what we can learn. And we just went door knocking. We'd try it for a season. And we, at the end of the season, we'd go, are we keeping it or are we not? And we we just kept scaffolding it. Now I thought nothing of it. And until I started to mix it with the best in the world and I was out on training camps and working alongside people in competitions until I saw my land conditioning compared to other swimmers' land conditioning. And I must say mine was was getting was better than most, if not one of the best. And that's when I realized actually when you track it back, it was from those younger years of experimenting. You know, Tim, experiments experiments don't really fail they just give you results it's what you do with the results so if, if it's not working out for you, you change the methodology or you change whatever's happening at the front end and it changes the, the result in the back end mm -hmm. and so so that, so for me that early stage it, it was more about setting the mindset of can you go out and just experiment and be okay when it doesn't go your way what's not to love about that Right. And you learned how to experiment in, in the process. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think one of the one of the key I remember going to a, a, a competition and I came out of the race and um, the typical thing is you'd get out the race, you'd go and speak to your coach 
And the coach, you and the coach would chat about this race. This particular time, I'd swum awful. And as I walked over to my coach, my coach said, so how was that? And I just went, don't ask, that was rubbish. And I slung my goggles and my hat off, my towel. And I started throwing my toys out of the pram <laughs> a little bit. And, and he asked me a question in that moment, which really made me stop and pause. He said, all of it was rubbish. And I said, oh, not all of it. He went, okay, tell me about the bits that weren't. <laughs> because in that moment, I was in such an emotive state that everything was just getting thrown out. And actually, the start was great. The turns were excellent. My front end speed was brilliant. I just didn't have the fitness to bring it back. And he went, oh, okay, so it's the fitness and the last length that we're working on then. He went, oh, 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 maybe yes. He took me from an emotional state to a rational state. And you think about how many times in business we're in that emotive state because we don't get the deal we want or yeah. it doesn't quite work the way we want. Or we get some really bad feedback and we're just focused on that. Right. And yet we've got so many good things happening on the other side that just needs a bit of rational thinking. It just needs to settle the emotions, ask some smart questions. And we followed this really simple model. Ask it answer it, action it. Mm -hmm. If you ask the right questions, right. answer it with honesty, and follow it up with action, it's only a matter of time before you get to where you need to be and where you deserve to be. Yeah. And that's the kind of model we use. Your, your points there also kind of make me think about the scientific uh, aspect of, mm. uh, of, of sports athletes, right? Just measuring, let's say, breaking down the 100 meters into their four uh 25 meter uh, lengths or continuing to ask the questions right because in, in scientists they they constantly ask questions yeah right? and and as a result they they come up with techniques not just new products but techniques and platforms it sounds like you were always very goal oriented and because you mentioned that early on when when people ask you you said i I'm, i wanted to become an olympian yeah right? so you set goal early on but you also learned to be very flexible, it seems like. You mm. may have been impatient, but you were very flexible uh, to experiment throughout your career, right? And it so sounds like that's what kind of led to your your success. Definitely. And, you know, if you reflect on like your practice as well and, yeah. and your, rut your routine, uh, how many hours did you use to practice and uh, what was your approach to continuing to go, be persistent? regardless of, you know, your your finishes. How did you manage to kind of drive yourself to continue to prepare, rehearse? Because that's the difficult part, I think. It does, it does. It, you're so right. Do you know, there, there was a couple of things in this. Firstly, the amount of training involved, mm -hmm. is, it, physical training is just off the scale. You know, 28 to 32 hours of training in the gym, in the pool, every week. Wow. And that's without competitions. If you've got competitions, you're there all weekend or all week. Mm -hmm. You know, you could be, you could be swimming anywhere from 75,000 meters to 100,000 meters a week, depending on what time of the year it is. You get a couple of weeks off a year if you're lucky, if the Olympic cycle falls well, and then you're straight back into it again and again. And, you know, you're, you're training through Christmas, you're training through all the celebrations. So you, you have to structure your life around it. You know, you have to bring people in who understand it and you have to have people around you. And you've got to be prepared to, you got to be prepared for people to come in for a season, a reason, or a lifetime. You know, that's mm -hmm. that's just the way it is, and you've got to just accept it. Um, but you know, motivation and inspiration are two very different things for me. Motivation can change on a daily basis, actually. There were some days I got out of bed because I was like, I said I'd do this, I've got to do it. There were other days I got out of bed and I I jumped out and I was like, Yes, this goal's for me this year. But all the way through it, the thing that really inspired me the most, and I didn't realize this until I was 25, the thing that inspired me the most, and I still have this now, is I get a kick out of laying down my best. That's where I get a kick out of. Now, I, th I thought for many, many years it was just swimming. Mm -hmm. And when I left swimming, I got really downhearted and I, and, I, and I really beat myself up because I was like, oh, my God, that thing's gone. And now... Um, I'm going to be nothing. Actually, I've found other things to put my personal best onto, and I know what that is now. And that's my inspiration. 
that that doesn't change. That threads. Th- I reckon if you cut me in half, it'll be it'll be <laughs> be etched somewhere in there. Right. I get a kick out of doing that, and I realised at the age of twenty five, it was a conversation with my sports psychologist Simon Hartley, and I said to him, you know, I've got so much on, so much is happening, and he said, you only have to swim two lengths of the pool as fast as you can. Don't overcomplicate it. <laughs> and I was like, you what? My job's a bit harder than that. That was my <laughs> first reaction. Right. And this is what I talk to big businesses about all the time and, and small teams, organizations is simplify your mission statement into a one line. I don't, don't overcomplicate it. My job is to swim two lengths as fast as I could. Yeah. And once I started to do that, the medals, the representing Great Britain, the standing on podiums, the listening to the national anthem, they were outcomes. They became outcomes of swimming really fast. Mm-hmm. But often we go into things going, we need that contract. I need that medal. We don't focus on the, what do we need to lay down in order for that to just come? We attract Mm -hmm. it. And that's where the power of keeping things simple. So to answer your question, that inspiration for me Mm -hmm. is about finding that simple statement and just delivering on it, deliver on it, keep beating that drum and just watch the world corresponds. Yeah. What what a what a great, great summary and you know, way to kind of distinguish, I think. The, the the actual process of competition mm. from the outcomes it seems like you know you 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 find that that, le- that level of competition the the actual you know preparation the competition even more exciting than standing on the podium and yeah. because that's the outcome of it and it's really yeah, it the is. emotions of being that you share it's also about shared mm. experiences probably uh yeah, I, would, yes. I would i would, I would imagine Right, it because is. yeah, you had a lot of other other people that played an important role in your success. Definitely, as well, right, including competitors. As you know, as you become a star, you, you realize then you know who are your real friends and who are your real supporters. I imagine. So, yeah. uh, how were you able to kind of make sure that you had the most supportive team by your side? A great question, that Tim. I think, uh, firstly. I needed to become better at communicating. I was I was a good communicator, mm-hmm. but I was a frustrating one at times. And holding up the mirror was something that we we advocated. But when it comes around to you holding the mirror yourself, <laughs> it can be a very, very difficult process. Um, I kept people around me who taught me the truth. That was important for me. But they did it with love. You know, they, they didn't have a vested interest in me answering the question other than me getting the right answer for myself. And I think that's important to have people around you who you truly, truly, who just believe in you as a person and want to see you grow. I think for me as well, I, I realized, I started to realize that actually the real gold at the end of any journey is the person you become. You know, f- for many years, I believed that, I had to build the team because I was working towards these medals and and that's absolutely right. But actually the thing I was really, really proud of, the most proud of and still proud of today was the person I became in the process. And that was the biggest challenge. You know, I'm only a small, I'm not even six foot in a, in a sport where it's, people are six foot five, six foot seven. I'm under six foot. I'm from the Northeast of England. I didn't fit the stereotype is what I'm trying to say. So I had a lot of personal hangups about, oh, I don't, I don't even sound the same as those guys. I I, I don't <laughs> look the same. And once I started f- what what I call in my coaching, face the right way, instead of facing outwards, I started to ask questions that faced inwards. And once you start asking those questions of yourself and answering them with real honesty and integrity, it is unbelievable what starts to come to the surface because effectively you're taking the journey you're taking the journey yourself. You are the journey because you get to take you everywhere. I say this to my kids all the time. You know, whether you pass or fail something is not the test. It's what you learn in that gap, in that point A to point B. That's the beautiful thing. You either, in that case, you either win or learn. There's no losing. Yeah. And that's where, you know, people are like, oh, you're always so dead positive, positive all the time. And I was like, I'm not. I'm optimistic because optimistic is about understanding that actually things will change. In fact, that's the one thing that's absolutely sure in life is everything's subject to change. Right. And an optimist just goes, yeah, I get the change and I'm willing to roll with it. Mm-hmm. 
doesn't mean to say that we're, we're, we're positive all the time. Cause I'm, I'm not, I have my negative moments, but I learn from them. In that process, did you find yourself motivating others as well? Other athletes or coaching others? Did you observe, <laughs> did you find yourself that you enjoyed observing the others in their process as well? Yeah. Yeah. I used to, I used to take motivation from, from all places. It wasn't just swimming. Mm -hmm. You know, I, if, if someone was, you know, doing some outstanding work in business, I wanted to hear about it. I wanted to read about it. I wanted to learn what were the steps they put in place? What's transferable? You know, how do they come across? Why are they, why have they got such a magnetic personality? What is it about? I was obsessed with the, the, the just the people who the tall poppy in the field. Yeah. I was obsessed with the tall pop in the field. I wanted to know how that got taller than everybody else because everybody else is not that tall. How did you do it? And that became quite a, a, an interesting research for me. Uh -huh. The second part was I didn't realize I was the inspiration and until deep into my career. I remember going to the trials, the Olympic trials in 2004. I got through the heat in the semifinal and the final in, in number two position. And that was in 2004, that was for the men's 200 metres breaststroke. I had a day in between the semi-final and the final. And I remember coming onto the poolside, getting warmed up for my um, final. My coach came over and he said, um, we've, got, we've got about 80 children up in the stand who've come down from all the way from Newcastle on a bus to see you. And I was like, What? And he said, yeah, yeah. They, they, they're here, look up. And they had this banner, go Chris. I was like, oh my goodness. And it was the first time in my career that I thought, uh oh, I'm not just doing it for me. Actually, this means a lot to others. And I didn't realize who was watching. I didn't know who was watching. Right. And it was a wonderful, wonderful gift, but also something I needed to manage in that moment. And, and I think that's a big part of stepping out of the crowd is, we have to manage our own expectations based on what other people expect from us as well. And that starts to happen as you climb chains. There's a classic phrase in coaching, which is, you know, every new level brings a new devil. It's, it's true. But if you embrace it for what it is, yeah. there's learning and development right at the core of it. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I ask that all because I imagine that you were already a mentor and a role model to mm. many others, even as you were uh, going through your journey. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, yeah, that's uh, what, what a moment there with a lot of people, right? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you, you, you know, in the 80s, uh, I uh, grew up uh, watching Matt Biondi and oh, those guys, you know, they, they were amazing. My, yeah, they were my kind of idols. And I was growing up in the Republic of Georgia. And uh, yeah, I, throughout my life and my inspiration, uh, I took swimming i competed in swimming for two years when i was like cool. 10 to 12 yeah uh in the butterfly and and uh, freestyle and uh, then i remember when i was 18 when i switched over i tried water polo i realized how different different it was <laughs> altogether it was just a, yeah i thought it was thought i'd uh kind of take some of the uh, some of the, some of the skills that i had and i and it was more about the mindset but i realized mm. how much stamina you needed you know we share a lot of uh, i think similar inspiration and uh, absolutely um yeah so uh, and, and you know what i what i've also found among athletes looking you know looking admiring some of the best athletes mm. is that uh those who you know who ultimately succeed they continue to experiment uh, Bodie yeah. miller and in in uh, alpine skiing i heard, mm. saw one interview where he talked about how he was a scrawny kid growing up uh that who couldn't compare physically or in terms of skills with other athletes uh and so he realized pretty quickly you know af after uh af after just watching them that if he were to you know win a gold medal it would be if uh, by winning it with the mindset but, yeah you know, and, and he started to experiment and you, you saw a lot of people kind of being frustrated because he would hit every gate and he would have horrible injuries but he ultimately ended up winning it was really the mindset yeah you know B B Bodie Miller American Alpine amazing skills. amazing yeah uh, so those are some of the stories that I, you know, kind of uh, that you make me think of, right? The the importance of sports psychologist, yeah, and, uh, you know, and the, and the mindset, the technology. So in in how you know swimming is also very technical. Mm. 
sport, right? And I know that it has undergone a lot of evolution in terms of the rules, the the yeah. in terms of what kind of costumes you can wear, right? The world records have been like now uh, yeah. broken many many times. Uh, how how do you, how do you see honoring sportsmanship across so many different temptations and different kinds of ways to, you know, maybe utilize technology or, uh, you know, different advice, right? Yeah. From, from from people who don't have the same kind of sportsman like, uh, uh, you know, approach. Let's say yeah. to sports, and I'm sure you probably you've met some of those, or you 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 know of those kinds of athletes as well uh right how, how did you uh you know how did you approach uh different types of ways to get ahead faster impatiently mm. let's say yeah. you know what, what was your approach yeah do you know swimming went through this real transition of getting rid of all of the suits the swimsuits if you remember yeah. so yeah. a lot of the technology that flooded the market was fantastic these suits were actually it's the first time globally swimming really hit the headlines outside of the olympics you know in every country people wanted to know how come people were breaking world records left right and center well it was it was these brand new suits that people were wearing and and Mm -hmm. for the we the the swimming shot that down they saw it as a bad thing and i thought we're missing an opportunity here like it's making the sport more interesting from the outside in so now they've they've cut the length of the swim shorts. So now they're shorts, they're jammers above the knee. They can't go below the knee. That's been in force well, well over 10 years now. But mm-hmm. for me, it was a real sad turning point in swimming because technology coming in, it's a little bit like the Formula One. I'm a massive fan of the F1. I love it. And just the technological advances every year just blow my mind and the science behind it. We almost in swimming said, we don't want to, be involved in that science and it was it was a bit sad i think it was commercially a, a bad decision but that's just me that's just my personal opinion i i thought it was great but oh, okay. there's always opportunities i feel for evolution to happen you know a world record gets broken and people go oh that'll never get broken again and mm-hmm. somebody comes along and tries a new way you know we're watching adam Peaty at the moment in the uk He's taken the world by storm in breaststroke. He's just, he's laying down something that is just unheard of, which is phenomenal. But he's done it in a very, very different way. His stroke's different. His physique's different. His mindset is different. And he's come along and he's taken the baton off other people and he's gone, thanks for that. I'm going to do it this way. And that's when I feel like you get a real great competitor come through like that who changes the game just by being brave enough to experiment like that, like you said, you know, having that courage to experiment, mm-hmm. the ones who are brave enough to go that little bit further get the best rewards. Like Adam, he's getting the rewards, they're coming in. Mm-hmm. And and I don't think we've seen the best of him yet, which blows my mind. Mm-hmm. It's phenomenal. Yeah, so you have a lot of hope for more uh, advances yeah. from a technological standpoint because they're, right? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, techniques change all the time. Physiques are changing. People are swimming less and lifting more in the gym and do more kind of dry land work. We're starting to see that. We haven't really seen the, the peak of that yet. That's still an evolutionary program that's rolling out amongst swimmers. So, mm-hmm. And I'm not at the epicenter of, of world athletes now in swimmers. I'm, it's just the stuff I'm hearing and seeing. But see. the physiques are definitely changing. You see them now. They're totally different i see yeah it's phenomenal so, so the physique so what what are some uh areas of uh opportunity uh in which we can test and and reach the capacity the human capacity in swimming you think is, yeah, is so, it in the training you mentioned or yeah i, th- I think it's going to come from the mindset more than the training i oh, think really? yeah i do i think there's still there's still lots of things you can experiment on and i'm sure you know, different physiques, different different people need different training programs. But I think you you're definitely going to see that tweak and change as we go through. But I think it's more mindset. I definitely believe it's more mindset, and and that's the exciting part for me is because that is that is what I was saying about ref- facing the right way, facing the right way is checking. Yeah, checking you coming back to you. What what is it that I need? And the best athletes in the world. And this is where the kind of self-centered thing comes from is the best athletes in the world do have that self-centeredness about them, but in a positive way, 
it's not all about me, 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 me. It's about actually what do I need in order to perform at my best? You know, my body is my race car. How you treat that race, how the F1 team treat that race car. They're all around it. They're changing, changing it, tweaking yeah. it, you know, all the time. And that is your, that's your chassis. That's your body. Mm-hmm. So it has to be an inward reflection. Um, and, 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 you know, I'm helping people now see that in the business world. There are a lot of differences in the business world compared to sport, you know, one being that in the business world, people tend not to recover as well. You know, in sport, we're taught to work hard and recover well. Yeah. Yep. In business, we tend to work hard and then go, oh, actually, if we just notch it up a bit more, notch it up a bit more, we do- that well-being piece is coming in, but it's still lagging well behind. In sport, there is no way you'd get the physical benefits if you don't match it with rest and recovery. It's simple. Mm-hmm. And I do believe a lot of people in business dare I say it, escape. They don't go on holiday. They they, they escape. Right. Um, they vacate. Whereas, you know, athletes build a life around them that they don't need to escape. They embellish upon it. Um, and I think that's the difference. I see. How oh, interesting yeah. uh, distinction there. Uh, so uh, so when, when athletes uh, train and, and maybe raise the bar on the difficulty level of their training, they they still they they see the outcome uh, mm. immediately, or they know that uh, they know the purpose of their uh, of their training more, and they don't feel like they need an escape. Like that that is that is what what's driving them. That's the their major dr- driving force. Whereas in the business world, it's it may be different, right? You, you, is it also the sense of purpose that is that may be missing in yeah. some people that they feel like they need to escape. Yeah, I agree. I, I I think so. I think maybe it's because they're they're not asking the right questions. They're facing the wrong way. They're mm-hmm. facing the wrong way and, and just mm-hmm. need to an, answer those questions. But yeah. you know, I don't believe that happiness is the opposite end of depression. I believe that the opposite end of depression is 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 purpose. And when you get people on purpose and they feel like they're on on in alignment with it, you get happy people. <laughs> it's quite straightforward. Right. it's it's getting them on purpose that's that's the key mm-hmm. um and i've worked with so many athletes and and people over the years who've just been out of alignment and it's it's a lot more straightforward than people give it credit but it's a lot harder as well in many respects so you enjoyed competition and mm. you personify the, the the value of competition i think you mm. you coach uh, uh you know about it to a lot of other leaders mm. in sports and beyond what what do you enjoy most about your current role when you coach other organizations, business leaders, as well? Yeah, great question. Um, to answer that question, I'm going to have to give you a little bit of an insight into who I am. So, sure. I'm a very I'm a very kind of out of harmony guy. So I know exactly who I am. So if, if I walk in a room, I kind of sense the vibe and the feel. I get a, a little bit of a a feeling. I can't quite put my finger on it at times. And, I, and I, I can't always articulate what it is, but I can go into a room and, and I can sense and feel. If someone's in pain, I'm that guy who's like, I need to tend to that person's needs. You know, I, I will outwardly go out my way to go, is everything all right? You don't look and sound the same. What's happening? That's, not, that's kind of my driver. It's a big driver for me. Mm-hmm. So for me, answering your question, this is where I feel I'm more on purpose than I ever was, even in my swimming days, is... I'm helping people to remove the resistance in their life to have a better time. But if you can think about it from my driver, that's that's taken my box. When I work with a CEO and he's working with 800 of his, his team and all of a sudden they're starting to feel that mission, they're all on mission, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to come alive. I don't need any more than that. Yeah. And you know, I've been working with a business this morning that are – they, like they said, they're in their teenage phase. They they they've gone from a small company to they're not quite huge and they're not quite small. They're just in this this phase, but they're having these mini breakthroughs. We had a massive breakthrough this morning and room full of three hundred people, and we just sat there just going, "Wow, this is happening now." We've been talking about this, we've been putting things in action, right. but we haven't seen it happen yet. It's happening now, and I sat there and I took about two or three minutes just watching the room, just thinking. And, this all came from just answering questions, just asking, answering, and action. 
and that that for me gives me that kick and that drive that's my driver and yeah. for any leader they need to understand what drives them as well that's an important part huge part mm -hmm. is, is most of your work let's say in england is it in a particular industry chris where do you where is yeah some of them yeah of your work in terms of executive coaching come from you know it's really interesting that and i see you know when i first came into coaching eight years ago nine years ago now um people said oh you you have to niche you have to really niche down on this and i'm like okay okay I niche 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 now I was looking for my niche looking everywhere yeah. and I, I didn't even know how to spell niche <laughs> at the time i was like what and yeah. I, I went out there and and i still haven't niched and and i'll tell you the reason why tim is because i truly truly believe the longer i coach the more i realize there's there's less of a thing around industry problems and more human problems Mm -hmm. you know in the line of work that i'm in mm -hmm. generally speaking most people know how to fix their own problems 99.9 percent .9 of people have got the answer it's just in a blind spot somewhere or they're so close to it they can't see it Great point. they're looking out here and it's actually at their feet right and, and that's the one of the reasons why i haven't niched is i'm having too much fun not niching I like i'm having that. far too much fun i work in hospitality one minute i work in the digital space with big companies the next working in the medical industry in the UK and Europe, it's just gone crazy, which is awesome. But the, the one thing I do niche on is I can only work with people who are willing. Okay. That's, that, that's my only constraint. That's my only thing I say to people is if you're going on this journey, it's over to you. I can ask the questions. I can pull the thread, but I can't do it for you. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I have had clients who have gone, oh, actually, that's a bit too honest, <laughs> a bit too scary they're not my client and and having the confidence to do that and say that has taken a little while i'm not gonna lie it's taken a little while yeah um but what a liberating feeling it is to work with people every room i walk into now i work with people who want to move the needle that's it no better yeah. feeling yeah i'm i'm so you, you cannot believe how happy i am to hear that because <laughs> i for many for for a long time i thought i i also was kind of uh the only person because i was facing the same kinds of uh feedback and questions from others and yeah. suggestions you know and 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 i still called this podcast all out coach i didn't limit it to the pharmaceutical industry brilliant i've interviewed a lot of people who are uh, michelin rated chefs or organizational change experts wow. or yeah amazon executives and you know lawyers from many different fields uh, because of that universal uh, you mm. know, nature uh, and, and what a lot of us are, in, you know, are interested in, uh, in, in t taking us to the next level actually is simpler, like you often mentioned, than hmm. you think. and, and mm. it goes back to, I think, being an independent thinker. And so I'm, uh, I'm so glad that you accepted my invitation to be my guest. Oh, uh, as thank a, you. As, a, as an Olympian, as an athlete, as a champion, and also as an independent thinker and a scientist, the way you think. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Thanks. Thank so, you. Yeah. Yeah. That really means a lot, that. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I, I want to ask you about the legacy, really, the legacy that mm. you have led for your country. And in swimming, you, you really left an important mark, I think, mm. on the British sports in, in swimming because when you represented your country. Um, what, what is your message to a lot of the all-out coach listeners, uh, in terms of their importance for their legacy, how they can mm. stretch themselves and, you know, lift others and, and transcend differences between each other and really extend mm. the boundaries of their roles in the same way yeah. that you have done throughout your career. Um, what, what is a, you know, fi final message or lesson you'd like to leave, leave us with? Good question. Good question. I think the first thing I'd like to lay down is you're only renting this space. You don't own it. No matter how much you think you own it, you're renting it. Yeah. It could be taken away in the blink of an eye. Life is fragile. It's the one thing I've learned in the last two years especially. Mm. And with that, because we're renting it, we have a duty and, yeah, we have a duty to leave it better than how we found it. And if you truly, truly want to leave a legacy, Ask the questions that others weren't brave enough to answer or even ask, and you'll start to see the answers leaving the legacy. You know, there, was a, there was a phrase said a few years ago that really made me sit up. It, tradition is something handed down by dead people. They're not here. Mm -hmm. they, 
don't know our challenge. And with the pace of change in the world being so quick, I mean, technology alone is driving that, but the pace of change and the, how we're connected, the fact that you and I are connected now and we've got a friendship, we've not even met face to face. It blows my mind five, 10 years ago. Yeah, it was still a thing, but not as prevalent as it is now and not on mass. Yeah. And that the pace of change being so fast now, we have every right now to challenge the traditions within our own thinking, within our own actions, our own organizations, our own teams, our sub teams. Actually, now is the right time to start to challenge that. And when we challenge that, we will start to see the opportunities to leave it behind better than what we did when we picked it up. And I think that's where the real legacy is. And like I keep saying, it's far simpler than we give it credit for. It is just a challenge to go against the grain. But that's the beautiful thing about it imparting your fingerprint it's unique for a reason isn't it the fingerprint it's unique for a reason and yeah. if we truly use it we can leave that mark behind forever um and that's that's a big driver for me as well thank you very much chris uh, i'm so happy and thank you for your inspiration that you've shared with all of us and uh can't wait to uh kick off the first yeah. medical affairs innovation olympics event as well september 15th awesome so, thank you so much so everyone connect with Chris Cook. He's very active across social media and uh, LinkedIn and uh, across other uh, platforms as well. Uh, Chris, is there is there a, w- a website that you'd like to uh, share with, with our listeners or your contact? Yeah. 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 So my website is chriscookgb.com and it's Cook without an E. We couldn't afford an E. <laughs> Not in my family. And um, I'm on LinkedIn as Chris Cook. Um, you'll see my big cheesy grin and on Twitter, Chris Cook GB. So at Chris Cook GB, but thank you. Thank you, Chris. I really enjoyed this conversation. Awesome. Thank you.